I have the privilege to present our next person here on stage, which is Will Hall. He is a therapist, a teacher, and survivor, uh, survivor of schizophrenia di diagnosis. He's an activist in the survivor movement for more than 13 years. He hosts the Madness Radio, and he is also a PhD candidate at Maastricht University in Holland. Welcome. Um, hey, Alla. Welcome. De hat ar vel dikt inspirarande at borahar. Jag ar lesen men det har ar den enda svenskan som jag kan. Tek till urverset arna. Urverset arna. Jag undrar om de urverseter det jag ser på svenska till engelska. So, that, was, that was my Swedish with a little bit of Spanish accent, I think. Uh, unfortunately, I don't speak any other languages. Solo hablo español, pero parece que no sirve pero para comenzar en español, ¿no? Nadie here. Ah, dos personas detrás hablan español, okay. Después, tres personas, okay. Better in English, I think, than Spanish. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank the Extended Therapy Room for inviting me here and for all the wonderful work that Hannah and Karina and Alexandra have done. Let's give them some applause for all the work that they've done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I want to welcome all of the roles here today. Some of us are professionals. Some of us are people who have are ourselves been diagnosed and been in the system. I know that some of us are family members, um, so I want to welcome all the different roles, people taking medications, people not taking medications. I also want to welcome all the spirits and voices that people may have with us today to welcome all the different parts that are here. And I'm very inspired um, by this um, gathering. I'm from California, so we say this gathering is really, really awesome. Um, so I'm really happy to be here, and I, um, I, I think um, I want to focus mostly on the work that I've done um, around medications and medication withdrawal, but I wanted to say a little bit about my own um, experience. I am, uh, I describe myself as recovering from a diagnosis of schizophrenia because the diagnosis is something that also I'm recovering from. The experience that gets called schizophrenia to me is a cultural conflict that my experience is that if I were living in a different cultural framework my experience would have been valued and welcomed and so I am li living with um, the uh, presence of spirits the presence of ancestors the presence of guides and in our Western scientific technological world that is not so considered uh, normal, but I think that that is normal in most of human history and most human um, cultures. Uh, so I um, am not someone who has be returned to normalcy. I am someone who has embraced my difference, if that makes a sense, any sense. And the uh, actually, what I've learned is that every experience that we call psychosis is normal. Every experience that we call psychosis is normal. In fact, you can create the experience of any kind of psychosis, whether it's voices or visions, visual things that people see, or strange beliefs, or extreme withdrawal, or extreme paranoia, or freezing, or um, disorganized states, or spontaneous speaking. You can recreate all of those under the right laboratory conditions if you just give people enough stress. So in order to understand this better, um, I am offering a very special workshop, and I think that I will bring this to Sweden maybe soon. Um, I, don't, I haven't talked with you about this workshop yet, but this is a very special workshop. Um, it's, uh, it's a workshop on how, to, how you can learn to hear voices yourself. 
And um, it's a 96-hour um, workshop in duration. It takes 96 hours. You cannot leave the workshop for 96 hours. And most importantly, you cannot sleep during the 96 hours. I guarantee you everyone will hear voices who comes to that workshop. Because actually what we call madness, what we label as, as psychosis, is just a variation of human expression. Any human being is capable of experiencing these things under the right, right life circumstances, under the right stress. So this is very, very important. But then we say, well, what is it that we need to help people around? What is it that we need um, to uh, support people around? Because clearly, I'm not saying that mental illness is a myth. I'm not saying that suffering is not real because I know that my suffering was very, very real. And I did need help. I did need support. But what I needed help with and support was not around some disorder or some disease or some illness. What I needed help and support around was around my own isolation and powerlessness. So when I work with people, I think fundamentally that is what people are suffering from, is isolation and powerlessness. And this is what my own experience has been, that my, the change between when I was in the hospital in my 20s and then went back into the system um, seven years later, the change from then to now is not the presence or absence of voices, because I continue to have voices. It's not the presence or absence of suicidal feelings, because sometimes I do have strong suicidal feelings. It's not the presence or absence of paranoia, because I can tell you, being in a room of many, many people, everyone staring at you can make you feel a little bit paranoid. So it's not the presence or absence of symptoms that is different for me now or in the past. What's different is that now I feel less isolated with my experience and I feel less powerless with my experience. So I think that's how we need to reconceptualize the work that we're doing. The um, screen here shows a guide that I wrote. It's the harm reduction guide to coming off of psychiatric drugs. This has been translated into many different uh, languages. It's available for free as a download on the internet. And um, it's the result of the support group work that we have done for many years in the United States. Um, back in 2004, I think, I um, helped found a group called Freedom Center in Western Massachusetts. And very quickly, we went from one meeting a month to two meetings a month to one meeting a week, to then two meetings a week, and then we had a yoga class, we had a writing group, we had um, different events, we had write, uh, a film series, and we saw that there was a huge, huge need that people were not getting met from the mental health system. And so people would come to our group and they would ask us very basic questions about their psychiatric medications, questions that had not been answered by their doctors and prescribers. They would ask us questions like, well, are benzodiazepines addictive? I hope everyone here knows that benzodiazepines are more addictive than heroin, extremely dangerous drugs. That um, the people would ask us questions like, is it possible to come off medications? Well, clearly the, the research literature shows that yes, some people are able to come off medications. I'm, I, I don't take medications. I was given a schizophrenia diagnosis. There are many, many people who live without medications. But then the question becomes, well, how do you know which person can come off medications, which persons cannot? And we would say, well, we don't know. There has been research, there have been studies that have tried to answer that question, which are the people that can successfully come off and which are the people that can't? And the answer was that we just don't know. And so that means that all of us who are interested in that need to explore it for ourselves. And so people would come to our groups and they would um, have many, many questions about medications. And we would end up starting to tell them the experiences that we had learned. And so eventually we gathered this into a guide that I wrote. And um, uh, this has been, been used in the psychiatric survivor movement. It's been used by families. It's also used by clinicians around the world. It's not a protocol. It's not a recipe. It's not a... A, uh, a plan that everyone should follow. What it is is instead, it's a guide for developing your own plan. It's a guide for finding your own way moving through these issues. And um, what I've seen is that there isn't 
one way that people are able to successfully withdraw. We clearly need much, much more research into the action of psychiatric medications and how they work and what they do for people. But if you talk to people who have come off of medications, you hear many, many different stories. Um, and so that's what we try to capture in the guide, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, some more. One of the main things that we uh, learned is that a harm reduction approach was really what was most helpful for people. Now, we borrowed this idea of a harm reduction approach from um, sex education and um, treatment for, for drug addiction and substance use. And the idea is that one approach is an abstinence approach, and it says the idea is to just get rid of the problem, get rid of the drugs. Um, another approach, a harm reduction approach, would be to say, well, actually, everybody is different. And so one person may need want to quit alcohol completely, but other people may continue to use alcohol intermittently. So that's called a harm reduction approach in drug treatment. And so in sex education, there's one approach that says to stop having sex, for teenagers to just stop having sex. That's an abstinence approach. And there's a harm reduction approach as well. That's consider the different things that people can do if they are going to continue to have sex, like using contraceptives, having condoms, using doing sex education, this, this kind of thing. And so we, we brought this into the issue of psychiatric medications because the reality is that I make a choice to live with certain levels of anxiety or certain struggles around suicidal feelings or certain experiences of um, voices, and other people might not make the same choices. So I have a certain kind of choice myself about I want to live without medications, and so I've learned um, how to um, work with and manage and respond to these other experiences that I'm having that are very difficult. Other people may have a different approach, but with a harm redu reduction perspective, you don't tell people that they must get rid of their voices, they must get rid of all their depression, they must get rid of all their anxiety. You also don't tell them that they must get rid of all their medications. It's a very individual and personal approach. It's up to each person to decide um, for themselves, weighing the risks and the benefits. So um, I just want to show you some of the, the things that are in the, in the guide. It um, it's, was illustrated by a lot of people in the um, psychiatric survivor movement, different photographers and cartoonists and illustrators. Um, there's uh, quite a lot of information. And um, I don't have time to go through everything, but it's really the idea is that it's a starting point for your own understanding. Um, it's written fr really from the perspective of people who are making the decisions uh, themselves, the, the patients. And um, that's very important because we haven't been given that choice. And a lot of people say, well, Will, why are you doing this work? Why is it that um, you feel you're not a doctor, you're not a pharmacologist, um, you're not a, um, a, uh, uh, a prescriber? And so are, wh how can you be doing this? And the answer is that now in society, when anyone goes to the doctor and they get a diagnosis and the doctor says, do this treatment, what's one of the first things that someone does today? They go home and they consult Dr. Google. And they get on the internet and they realize that one doctor says do this and another doctor will say do this and the other doctor will say do something else and then you have the whole world of holistic and alternative medicine, you have Ayurveda, you have Chinese medicine, you have all these different approaches, and then people end up making the choices for themselves. So that's all we're doing with this guide, is offering people information that can help them to make their own uh, choices. And um, a lot of the approach is, uh, uh, you know, very much an experimental approach. Different people are trying things and learning things for themselves. What we've seen is that one person, if they make a very small reduction, will not have a problem with a very small reduction. Another person who makes a, um, a small reduction, just a very small reduction, will have a huge, huge reaction just because of that. Now, why, why is that? Why is it that people make that um, incredibly strong reaction? One person will have a strong reaction to a, a small reduction, but another person will have no reaction to a small reduction? We don't know. Different people have different relationships with drugs and medications. Everyone is very different. So um, 
The guide is available for download, and it's in a number of different languages. It's available for free. I created a kind of a, um, a summary of some of the basic uh, concepts in the guide. Uh, so there's two different kinds of approaches. The medical model that we've heard um, a lot talked about today, and so that's the disease-centered view would be the medical model, the disease-centered view. And then there's the drug-centered view, which is more about a harm reduction approach, which is where we look at the drugs themselves and whether or not they're useful and, and what kinds of effects that they have, rather than looking at the disease or thinking about the disease. So what are medications? A medical model says medications are treatment for mental illness. A drug center view says that medications are psychoactive substances that can be useful. Psychoactive substances that can be useful. Um, how do they work? The medical model says they correct an abnormal imbalance disease process of the mental health conditions. Whereas a drug center view says they work by creating an abnormal chemical process in the brain, like all psychoactive substances. So when you take alcohol, you're creating an abnormal chemical process in your brain. Plus, there's a placebo effect and an expectation effect. A disease center view says that when you would use a medication is when a particular mental disorder is present. Whereas a drug center view says when to use a medication is when the experiences of the drug effects are useful. Um, why are they useful? A disease-centered view says that they're useful because of the therapeutic action on an underlying mental disease process. Whereas a drug-centered view says actually that the um, usefulness of a psychiatric medication arises from being in a psychoactive drug-induced altered state. So you take a drug, it causes a change in consciousness, and then you see whether that change in consciousness is useful or not. What is the target of the medication? Well, from a disease-centered perspective, from the medical model, the target is the symptoms of the disease. But from a drug-centered view, the medication is gonna affect the body and mind of anyone who takes that medication. It's not just about the disease. Um, what about the risks? In a disease-centered view, the idea is that the, whatever the drug risks are, psychosis is so terrible that the drug risks are worth it. From a drug-centered view, Actually, the drug risks can be severe, and sometimes they're worse than the experience that they're prescribed for. So very, very cautious about the drug risks. So the paradigm that we hear, and a lot of patients are told this, is that you need to take medications just like a diabetic needs to take insulin. This is the main paradigm that the disease-centered view has for medication use. Whereas in a drug-centered view, and a harm reduction view, the paradigm is more like alcohol for social anxiety. So many of us, I know, we go to a party and we feel very nervous at the party. We're meeting all these new people and we, we see everybody's having fun and they're talking and we're, we'll feel, feel very shut down. We're having social anxiety. What do we do? Skull. We reach, for, we reach for the beer or the alcohol, we drink, and then now our anxiety goes down. And so what we've done is we've essentially medicated a symptom, in a sense. We've, we've used alcohol for social anxiety. We know society is pretty honest about the risks and dangers of alcohol. Society is getting more honest about the risks and dangers of, of cannabis. Um, but we know that there are risks and benefits to these um, substances. What we haven't done is we haven't had an honest discussion about the risks and benefits of psychiatric medication. So the paradigm would be like, just like alcohol can be helpful for some people, some people, if they drink alcohol, they don't like the effects. They get tired, they get sleepy, they get anxious. I know for me, alcohol is not something that I, that I find useful or helpful at all. Other people um, do. Some people, when they want to work more efficiently and more effectively, they drink coffee. Other people just get a headache or get tired when they drink coffee. So everyone is going to be different on how they respond to a medication or, or, or a substance that they're using. So the key question that we're asking uh, from a medical model is, is there a disease present? Is there a disorder present? If bipolar is present, then you need to take the medication. If schizophrenia is present or depression is present, you need to take the medication. Do you have a mental disorder? The key question that we're asking from a drug-centered view 
is, is the drug useful to the person relative to the risks? And useful is going to be a dialogue. It's going to be a conversation for that person because it's a very subjective question. So in terms of helping people come off of medications, um, I, there's a lot in the guide, but some of the key things that I do. First of all, um, I don't just start talking about what's the right dosage to start with in the reduction. The first thing I do before a reduction starts is to talk about what support the person has. Sometimes the prescriber is a supportive person in that person's life, sometimes not, and so we work on that. Getting a different prescriber or dealing with that relationship. Talking about the support that the person may have from their family, people in their life. Who are they going to turn to if they start to have a difficult time with their withdrawal? So working on the support is the, one of the first steps that I do. The second thing that I do is I say, well, you're reducing the medication. What are you going to put in its place? What are you going to do to deal with some of the things that the medication has been helping with? If the medication helps you with anxiety, what are you going to do around the anxiety that may come up? If you may have had suicidal feelings, if you may have had um, paranoia, what are you going to do to deal with those kinds of things? And then we have a conversation about what might help them because there's many, many, many things that all of us do for our wellness and our mental health that can certainly help someone in a withdrawal process. Then we come up with a plan, um, and I've seen all kinds of different plans work. What, Generally speaking, going slow and gradually is the better way to go because you tend to minimize the potential withdrawal effects. It's not a guarantee, but if you're drinking coffee every day and you stop drinking coffee cold turkey, if you just suddenly, what's going to happen? You're going to get a headache. You're going to have all these withdrawal effects. So if you want to come off of coffee and you've been drinking it regularly, you want to go slowly. You reduce, you go down to decaf, and then slowly. The same principle with psychiatric medications. And again, this is not a recipe or protocol. This is just the experiences that we've seen tend to be what are useful for people. But everybody is going to be different. And sometimes there are situations when you do want to come off all of a sudden. And sometimes the person just finds the drug so intolerable that they make that choice. Um, and then there's a question of flexibility. Once the plan starts, maybe you want to go slower. Maybe you want to go back up on the medication if things are, are too overwhelming or are, are very difficult, the person's withdrawal effects are difficult. And then the life change that goes along with this, that actually a medication is not just a chemical. A medication is a symbol. A medication is relationships. A medication is a whole life experience is in that pill. And so what kinds of life changes is the person going to start uh, making? For example, dealing with their emotions that are coming up, dealing with things that maybe the medications have been putting down. Uh, the three main withdrawal effects that we see people go through, one is anxiety. The second is um, flu-like symptoms and sometimes very strange physical changes that are detoxification and like being ill and people feel very tired or they feel achy or they get headaches, so flu-like symptoms. And then the third is sleep deprivation. I, I can't emphasize how important it is to pay attention to the sleep deprivation piece. Because um, what I've seen is that for many, many people, the reason they go into a psychotic crisis is sleep deprivation. And what they need is help managing their sleep, not to be on lithium for the rest of their life or antipsychotics, but just to learn that some people are vulnerable to sleep deprivation, and it's going to cause them to have serious problems. Um, so that's just a sketch of the kinds of things that we work with. And there's a lot of information here. There's a lot that I could talk to you about. There's a lot of different things that we could go into. But really what I'd like to do now is I want to encourage you to um, maybe just to, to just take a few minutes and turn to someone nearby, someone maybe that you don't know, that you haven't uh, met before, and just have a conversation just for a few minutes and talk about some of the experiences that you have had or someone that you know has had that were good experiences with psychiatric medications and were not good experiences with, with psychiatric medications. Just have a conversation for just a few minutes about some of the good experiences that you've had or someone that you know has had and also some of the bad experiences that you've had or someone that you know has had. Okay, and then I'll, I'll tell you when to come back with the time.
Okay, just take another moment or so. Did people find it was a little harder to talk about some good experiences with medications? Yeah, a little, hard, little harder to talk about them. I'm, I'm happy to just open it up if someone wants to have a comment or someone wants to ask a question or maybe talk a little bit about, yes. I'm Luc Debris from Belgium and I'm the father of a son who was diagnosed schizophrenics and I'm also a scientist, a scientific researcher. And I found your guide via the blog of Monica Cassani. I was very grateful, at least someone was talking about withdrawal. And I think it's on page 12. You have 44% of people who tried succeeded. And my son wanted to get, all, get rid of all the drugs. He was on. And then 44 that succeeded, that means 56 that didn't. And my son was just out of the margins for the, for the 44. And so my reaction as a scientist, how do we make 95, if not 100% of people to succeed? Yes, that's the, that is the right question yes. to ask. And, and that is why we're here, and that's where we're starting the Institute for, International Institute for Drug and, Withdrawal. And yeah. My son was on three drugs at that time, and I had learned in my career that when you manage a mixture, of components, whatever, mixture of uh, f flavors, whatever, you have to consider the relative proportions, That's not right. only the dose. And so I helped him get down, keeping the relative proportions constant, and down the three together. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And by contrast to others who go one by one, he had much less physical pains. Interesting. That's very interesting. Yes. The guide is in its second edition now, and I added a lot of information because people said that they had learned certain things. That's not one that I have heard about, but I will, I'll look into that. Well, this is one of the things that I'm doing with my PhD at Maastricht University, is we're developing a world survey of antipsychotic withdrawal. And one way to learn about withdrawal is to ask people who've done it successfully. There's many, many ways to research this, but we're just at the beginning of researching it. I also think that there's a lot of research from the chemical dependency and alcohol and drug treatment world, and also the brain injury world and the chemical injury to brains and how brains can recover and how people are recovering um, in, in that sense that can also be brought to bear on this question of psychiatric drug withdrawal because it is about chemical injury, I believe. So, yeah. I have experience from coming up of uh, anti uh, epileptic medical uh -huh. medicines uh -huh. and uh, one of my experiences was that the hardest battle was with the doctors yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, finally um, when I got my uh, getting off plan uh, I used very um, long time <coughs> getting off the drugs but I didn't feel anything uh, major relapses or anything. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now my next battle is getting off the diagnosis. Right, that's harder. I was on medications for about three years. I was on a disability payment for about 15 years. It was harder to come off of the disability payment and the dependency on the identity and the vulnerability that I had. That was much, much harder. So yeah, so thank you. Other thoughts or questions? Uh, I'm a social worker. And uh, what I find is, is really hard is providing a safe place. People are very scared and yeah. they want to get off them, but they can't because there's too much fear. And there's no place, the system doesn't offer a safe, secure place where you could go and feel safe while all this is happening. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important issue for activism and research, that there need to be sanctuaries and places to go, and also a conversation that can happen about how can we make where you're living now more safe. And working with the fear is a huge thing, especially the fear in the social network, taking the time to work with the doctor, to work with the family members, because the fear, fear is, is amplified. When you're around fearful people, you become more fearful. One of the questions I often ask people is, when was the last time you were in crisis and in the hospital? And then what is different now? What, what was going on then and what's going on now? Sometimes people were in the hospital, they had a terrible, terrible experience, they went on the medications, and then they haven't been in the hospital for 10 years. But they're still afraid that they're gonna go back to where they were 10 years ago. So I have a conversation with them about what's different in their life, and often they see that they don't have to be afraid of 
10 years ago because things are so different. They have so many different kinds of supports in place and there isn't as much of the stressors that were driving them into that crisis in the past. So let's go here. I'm Roger and I'm, I'm working with the addiction and the press is not the right question for you, perhaps for Gutsche here or Whitaker, but the thing I see very often that people are uh, kind of um, um, over super over medicated by psychiatry or yeah. um, uh, and combine that with uh, drugs and alcohol and, and they have yeah. three or four or five diagnoses and five or six medicines. Yeah. Is there any research done on how all these things interact is a question. That's a huge, that's a huge question. Uh, not that I have seen, but maybe Peter or, or Bob might have a thought about that. The short answer is people don't know what they're doing. Uh, these drugs interact in so many different ways yeah. and nobody knows. It's a giant social experiment, and we are the guinea pigs, unfortunately. And on that note, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much, everybody, for the talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you.